Amen. Thank you, Liz. Appreciate your help and those that play on the platform. Appreciate you. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians 4, if you have your Bibles, starting in verse 1. Booker T. Washington, uh, born a slave in 1856 and died in 1915, <clears throat> became a key educator and an abolitionist and a very influential man, said, Success is to be measured not so much by the position that one has reached in life as by the obstacles that one has overcome while trying to succeed. So in other words, you may not be <clears throat> in a high-flying position, but that doesn't mean success is not yours. There are a lot of things in life that attempt to measure our success, but very, very seldom do they tell the whole story. Our report card, I don't know, do they still do those? You bring it home, say, here it is, Mom, but let me explain. <clears throat> On the scale, isn't muscle heavier than fat? Our pay stub or bank statement, and on and on it goes, and a financial advisor. Those can be useful in a reality check, but people aim to measure our success can be wrong. And we can be wrong in judging ourselves. You can be wrong in judging yourself. And so we have to consider <clears throat> God's judgment is what really matters. Hallelujah. Let's look in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. It says, Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. And indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that doesn't make me innocent. It's incredible. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive their praise from God in difficult times. Father, we ask this evening that you would touch every heart in this place. Encourage your people, God. Touch those that are online. Save souls, God. We're asking for miracles in this day and hour. We need you to move. We ask your blessing. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's consider, first of all, the issue of timing. You and I have a limited time in life. <clears throat> One of the things in life that gives us wisdom is not Google. It's not your horoscope. It's not whatever you think it might be, a fortune cookie. But in Psalms 90, verse 12, David says, Teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Teach us to number our days that we are all here for a limited time. John Gill's commentary says, The meaning of this petition is that God would teach us to number our days as if the present one was the last. For we cannot boast of tomorrow. We know not, but this day our souls may be required of us. So we're all headed in the same direction, <clears throat> at the same speed, <clears throat> and we're getting older. Some are just closer to the older place <laughs> than others. But, you know, time waits for nobody. I have a song that I'm, I, I want to learn, and we're going to do it Sunday if, if we can pull it off. But it's called um, Winds of Change. And the chorus goes, The hands of time go round and round. They don't slow down when you lose your way. At every turn, the things you learn, you wear them proud like you wear your name. And as you go on down that road, don't let dust get in your eyes. It blows in the winds of change. So the hands of time keep moving. Time is something that keeps moving along, and we would be wise to factor in that we have a limited time in this life. Dr. Leslie Weatherhead calculated the average length of a life using the hours of one day to illustrate the importance of recognizing the value of time. He concluded that if you're 15, if your age is 15, 
the time is 10.25 a.m. If your age is 20, the time is 11.34. If your age is 25, the time is 12.42 p.m. If you're 30, the time is 1.51. If you're 35, the time is 3 o'clock. If you're 40, the time is 4.08. At age 45, the time is 5.15. If you're 50, the time is 6.25 p.m. By age 55, the time is 7.24. If you're 60, the time is 8.42. If you're 65, the time is 9.51. And if you're 70, the time is 11 p.m. So the true measurement of success in life comes from God. It does not come from man, and it does not even come from ourselves. That's a sobering thought. That's a helpful thought. Daniel Webster said this, My greatest thought is my accountability to God. What an amazing attitude in life to consider our accountability to God. We're really, I mean, very, I, obviously there's people that we have to please in, in, in various ways. I want to please my wife and so on and so forth and, and all of those things and my employer. But what really matters is God's judgment upon our lives. The text goes on to talk about bringing hidden things to light. And so when it talks about that, this brings the importance of integrity to the picture. In verse 5, <clears throat> Of our text, he will bring hidden things to light and reveal the motives of the heart. Now, that word motive there is the Greek word boule, and it means a resolved plan. I want you to say a resolved plan. A purposefully arranging. Now, when we think about motives, we automatically think of human motives or our motives. And we need to consider our motives, right? We need to consider the motives in our own lives. An elderly man on the beach found a magic lamp. He picked it up and a genie appeared. Because you have freed me, the genie said, I will grant you a wish. The man thought for a moment and then responded, My brother and I had a fight 30 years ago and he hasn't spoken to me since. I wish that he'll finally forgive me. There was a thunderclap and the genie declared, Your wish has been granted. You know, the genie continued, most men would have asked for wealth or fame, but you wanted the love of your brother. Is it because you're old and dying? He said, no way, the man cried, but my brother is, and he's worth $60 million. <laughs> Motives are important. Motives, someone said, are invisible, but they are the truest test of character. You cannot live an effective life without ever questioning your motives. This is why we need to have a personal prayer life. We, we talk about relationship with God, right? We always talk about well, it's not a religion, it's a relationship with God. I don't have religion. People say, oh, you're religious. I say, I'm not religious. I have a relationship with God. I mean, no, there's a big difference. But if we have a relationship with God, a sincere prayer life will force you to examine your plans. It'll force you on a regular basis to check your motive. If you read 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it talks about the motive of what? Of love. And so without this motivation, of love in life, we're spinning our wheels. Love is always patient, it says. Love is always kind. Love is never envious or arrogant with pride, nor is she conceited. And she is never rude. She never thinks just of herself or even gets annoyed. She is never resentful, is never glad with sin. She's always glad to side with truth and pleased that truth will win. She bears up under everything, believes the best in all, there is no limit to her hope and never will she fail. So the Bible says love never what? Fails. Or love never breaks down. Sometimes love has to be 
uh, involves you putting up with things. Love involves you putting up with setbacks. Love involves you putting up with people. Because if you want someone to love, with you, love you, if they truly love you, they'll, they'll put up with you. That's a good thing. But as we consider our motives, and we need to do that, how about God's motives? Let's consider his motives tonight. In other words, let's consider God's resolved plan, his purposeful arrangement. What is God up to? The Apostle Paul says in verse 1, we are stewards or managers of the mysteries of God. So we are, check this out, we are entrusted with God's secrets. If you go back to uh, 1 Corinthians Chapter 2, starting in verse 6, out of the ISV version. <clears throat> However, when we are among mature people, do we speak a message of wisdom, but not the wisdom of this world, nor of the rulers of this world who are passing off the scene. Instead, we speak about God's secret wisdom that has been hidden with God, destined for our own glory before the world began. None of the rulers of this world understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, and no mind has imagined the things that God has prepared for those who love him. And then verse 10, but God has revealed those things to us by his spirit, for the spirit searches everything, even the deep things of God. So it says here, God's resolved plans are for our glory. He really does want to bless people. Sometimes this is obvious, and other times it's not so obvious. It's kind of hidden. But the Bible says God's secret wisdom that has been hidden. There are things that are hidden in God's economy that are revealed to us through Jesus Christ and the ongoing revelations that the Spirit of God brings. Listen again, this is in the New King James, but as it is written, no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, and no mind has imagined the things that God has prepared for those who love Him. And then verse 10, God has revealed those things to us by His Spirit, for His Spirit searches everything even the deep things of God. So the Spirit of God searches things out. He uncovers things. He gives us understanding and revelation. I found out that I can hear from the Spirit of God oftentimes when my knees hit the ground. That God speaks to us. That God reveals things to us. When you have conversations with various people, you begin to discover that not everyone understands the things of God. They hear what you're saying, and maybe they could repeat it back, but they're not getting it. You get me? They don't quite understand what you're saying. I talk to, to you know, a number of people where I work, and, and there are some that are saved. There's some in law enforcement that are Christian. But there are others, they're just, you know, they got a, a clean record, and so they're doing this uh, type of job, and they like guns, and they like fast cars. And so I try and talk to them about Jesus. <clears throat> and sometimes it just kind of goes in one ear and out the other. In 1 Corinthians 2.14, a person who isn't spiritual doesn't accept the things of God's Spirit, for they are nonsense to him. He can't understand them because they are spiritually evaluated. And so we're talking about discernment. Discernment. I was talking to uh, Marilyn and Hector. They used to work for a company that would buy gold from their customers. And they were explaining to me how to tell if it's real gold or if it's imitation. And I still don't quite get it, but th there's chemicals involved and there's some sort of rock involved. And I think there's a picture of... Um, Iced tea involved. So can, but, but if you're looking to stay in business, then you need an accurate way to evaluate the product, don't you? You kind of know what you're doing. You and I cannot buy, in the same way you and I cannot buy into every conversation or every commentary we hear. We hear. Well, brother, God helps those that help themselves. 
Would you show me where that is in the Bible? Cleanliness is next to holiness. Want to show me where that is? And there's probably all kinds of things. Jesus drank, I like this one. Jesus drank wine, didn't he? I tell him, show me where. Well, it's in there somewhere. I know where the text is, but it actually didn't say he drank anything. And it doesn't say it was Mad Dog 2020 either. Sorry, that wasn't in my notes, but. I'm sure most of us have had conversations about the invasion of Russia into Ukraine. How many of you have had a discussion with some, somebody at work, at school, at home? <clears throat> we cannot just talk about it on a Fox News level or a CNN level, merely political, that is. Russia is Magog, and Putin could be Gog. These are biblical uh, b- biblical um, nation and person. The kingdom to the far north is Magog. Listen, I want to read you a portion of scripture <clears throat> and you make your own judgment. Ezekiel 38 verse 1. <clears throat> it's been called the Ezekiel War. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog, the land of Magog, of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal, and prophesy against him and say, Thus says the Lord God, <clears throat> Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal. I will turn you around, put hooks in your jaws, and lead you out with all your armies, uh, horses and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia, which is Iran, Ethiopia, which is Ethiopia, and Libya <clears throat> are all with him, all of them with shields and helmet. Gomer, which is uh, Turkey, and all of its troops, the house of Togomar, from the far north and all its troops, many people are with you. Verse 8, this is still Ezekiel 38. After many days you will be visited in the latter years. You will come into the land of those brought back from the sword and gathered from many people on the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate. They were brought out of the nations, and now all of them dwell safely. You will ascend coming like a storm, covering the land like a cloud, you and all your troops and many peoples with you. And then it goes on and shows how they are going to <clears throat> cause some damage, but God is going to step in ultimately. Now, I'm not making light of the devastation that's happening over there at all. Pray for them. We're fasting and praying for them. But in all this that is happening, <coughs> this could easily be a positioning for the Ezekiel 38 and 39 war. So when we talk about what's happening, we're not just going to say, oh, this person's messing up, and look what they did, and we did the sanctions too late. We're not, we've got all these arguments. And, and you, you can discuss that. That's fine. But don't miss the fact that this is in a key location. They're not very far from Israel. And Russia is the kingdom to the north. And... No doubt we're going to be looking at that a little more as time goes on, but you cannot escape the fact that this is getting very close to the Middle East. <clears throat> Iran is still busy <clears throat> doing things, and Syria still has fighting going on. Russia is a superpower and has allies, not friends, but allies with some of these other nations. Now, I, was, I asked for understanding... <coughs> as to what is happening today. And even more, I pray that God would prepare hearts to receive the gospel. Because I can tell you that not everybody's open to the gospel. I, I don't have to tell you that. Most of you know. I, I, I talked to Chris a couple weeks ago, and I wasn't expecting him to be open, and he was. I went back to the same gas station the next week, and I talked to a guy that wasn't open at all. So you gotta, you know, you just gotta, you gotta be able to handle a little bit of pushback. You can't lose it because somebody doesn't want to take your flyer. You can try and get him in a headlock and force him to take it if you want, but I don't know if that works. But see, much of California has turned its back on God. 
I think that's the simple truth. We've been here long enough to know that much of L.A., I'm not saying everybody, but obviously there's a large segment that has turned their back on God or put him on hold. I want to live the way I want to live. I'm okay. Well, the fact of the matter is you're not okay. You need God in your life. And so when you witness to someone, you can feel that sometimes. But I'm here to tell you that God can turn things around. God can move supernaturally upon hearts. God can cause us to run into individuals. You never know the condition and the, the situations in their lives. You never know what they're going through and what God's deal, <coughs> dealing with them about. So let's consider God's motives tonight. And what is God doing in all this? We see what's happening. We don't let it just end <clears throat> with a military conflict. Don't let it just end with a political uh, uh, persuasion. Well, China's doing this, and, and, and believe me, <clears throat> I have those conversations. I have my contacts of people that have various uh, 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 convictions and opinions. <clears throat> but when you're talking to people <clears throat> about what's happening, you've got to bring God's motives into it. What is God doing? What is God trying to say to you? So let's close with the final thought in this text, and that is praise from God. We have a future to look forward to. Can you say amen? We have a future. Some of you are here tonight, and you're thinking, in just a few moments, I'm going to have some dinner. And you're looking forward to that. You're wondering, hmm, where do I go? Should I go to Chick-fil-A? No, it's too far. In and out, no, it's too crowded. We have a future that goes far beyond where you're going to eat tonight. <clears throat> God is a generous, generous God, and he is a righteous God. He's a just God. God's a fair God. But... His understanding. See, God has a different perspective than you and I. How we are viewed here. The Apostle Paul says this. It is a very small thing to me that I should be examined by you. In other words, people may put us down, and it's not warranted. <coughs> or people may exalt us. You're the greatest, and you don't deserve that either. It could go both ways. But if we will make it our aim to be pleasing to God, I believe three things will happen. If we make it our aim to say, you know what, Lord, you are the judge. <coughs> I want to do things right before you. Amen. One of the things that helps me in my marriage is knowing that God is very concerned as to how I treat my wife. I'm not saying I don't love her and care for her dearly, but I also know that God is watching. And there's a responsibility that we have. But <clears throat> first of all, <clears throat> God will be glorified. If we make it our aim to please God, God will be glorified, and his blessing will be upon your life. His blessing upon your life. This is more than just you getting that parking spot. It's more than you just, you know, having a good day, but God's blessing will reside upon your life. Not much is said about Jesus when he was a boy. You ever notice that? And when he was a teenager. What was Jesus like as a teenager? What was he like as an eight or nine-year-old kid? Was he annoying? Was he hard to get his chores do, do his chores around the house? The Bible says in Luke 2, verse 52, And Jesus increased <coughs> in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. So the second thing I believe God can give us as we make him his our aim to please is God can give you favor with people. God can give you favor with with people. For the most part, that has been my experience over the years. If you want to do something for God, 
other people are going to be involved. And you can gain favor with people. Whatever you're trying to do in life. <coughs> How many know it's good to have friends? It's good to make friends. Instead of going around trying to get everybody mad at you. You can make friends. You can gain favor with people. I believe God has given us favor here. And I'm believing for more favor. <clears throat> the third thing that is revealed here is that you and I have a future reward. We have a future reward. I know God can bless us here and now, and I'm thankful for that, and I pray for that. But there is a future blessing that God has planned for those <clears throat> who love him. And he, everything in this life that we think is awesome is going to pale in comparison to what God has in store for us. Everything, the absolute best day you've ever had here, will not even compare. And I close with this thought. I remember when President Bill Clinton misquoted 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. He's getting up there. You know a lot of presidents, even though they probably never cracked a Bible, they, they like to throw a verse out there. Come on, asking his speechwriters, go on, give me a verse, give me a Bible verse. Bible verse, what do we do? Uh, who, uh, you know, my, my brother's wife's whatever, he's a pastor, give him a call. <laughs> Somebody give me a verse. <clears throat> so he says these words, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9. I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things that we can do. Now, how many know that's not the way it goes? But that's how he said it. When I first heard him, he says, I has not seen it. Whoa, he's quoting the Bible. That's a good verse. But then he says, the things that we can do. And so that, he's, what he's doing there is he's playing politics with God's word. And I'll give you the correction. <clears throat> I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for what? Those who love him. Those who look to God to please him. To please him. Because we know that God is a very watchful God. And we make it our aim in life to please God. Chances are you're going to please people as you're pleasing God. But if you don't please people because they don't like your stand or they don't like your convictions or they don't like your Christianity, <coughs> the key is that you're pleasing God. When Peter and John were arrested for preaching the gospel and they told, him not, they told them not to preach anymore, he said, who should we listen to? Should we listen to God or should we listen to you? So they knew for sure that their aim was to obey the Lord. But what a wonderful and glorious future that we have in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. What a joy. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting older, and, and I'm, not gonna, I'm not planning on retiring, but I don't want to be wearing a tool pouch for the rest of my life either. So I'm thinking about things, you know, thinking about somehow to secure my future. But, you know, this goes far beyond anything you I, you and I. Well, I'm going to move to Montana. Who wants to move to Montana? <laughs> Nobody's there. I'm just kidding. I hear people got these glorious plans, plans for retirement. You know, I mean, that's, there's nothing wrong with that, nothing at all. In fact, it's very wise. But how long do you plan on living? How long do you think the old ticker is going to keep ticking? Uh, well, my dad lived to. I'm coming up to the time when my dad passed away. Does that make me think a little bit? Yeah, it makes me think a little bit. But I'm not worried because I know I have future reward. I have future reward. I want <clears throat> blessing today. I want to bless my wife, take all of that. But I've got a future reward, and so do you if you love God. 
glorious, unbelievable, eye has not seen. Dude, you can't even imagine this. Hollywood couldn't even come, nor ear heard, nor even entered into the heart of man. The things <clears throat> that God has in store, he has prepared for those who love him. <clears throat> He's prepared things for you. You've got a glorious future in Christ Jesus if you will love him and you will serve him with a sincerity that you have a glorious future. Amen. Regardless of what happens in this world, you love God, you're heaven bound. You got a blessing to look forward to and what a joy that is. Hallelujah. Can we bow our heads tonight?